All right. So, what are we doing today? Well, I'm sneaking around the Armed Forces Museum again. Uh, we've opened the doors for a little bit, or at least not to the public. We're going to try and get the place COVID-19 ready. Um, however, this little cabinet suffered some lightning damage. Um, at least is usually the case while we've been away and two of the cameras don't work. So I've got a bunch of bits here. I've got some new camera balance down here. I'm going to see if we can get those cameras working again. All right, well, we're in. Now cameras one and three aren't working. And that looks like camera one there. So we'll start with that ballon. Usually what happens here, we're running these ballons which run um, the cameras down a piece of Cat5. Um, they're analog high definition cameras. Now, um, usually what happens is there's a lightning strike adjacent to the museum, which is quite common because there's a lot of uh, exposed area here. We're pretty much the tallest thing in the area. Um, it blows up the filters in these melons. The power still works, but the filter doesn't. So I'm just going to replace that and we'll see what happens. All right, so I think I might have found some of the problem. The plug just fell to pieces, or well, the BNC plug. For the record, that's what a good one should look like. All right, let's swap these over. All right, so I'll just change balance both ends. Um, they're still not working. So I plugged in my little inline voltmeter. We're only getting six volts. That could explain a lot. We need about 12. Oh, I'll just wriggle it. Now we get 12. Maybe it's a power connector problem. I did bring another power supply. And that's still 11.3 volts. It's still not quite right. I think our power supply is shagged. Right, so I spent about two hours fault finding this, but I worked out it was a body power supply. So I've plugged one into the spare socket here. I'll have to come back with some new supplies at some point. Um, this power supply, unfortunately, is not enough to run both the cameras that are down. So uh, I'm going to have to come up with a solution to that. I think I might modify a computer power supply and cram it in here and just run everything off the one supply um, and go with that. Anyway, for now, problem solved. Let's get on with the museum tour. All right, we're going to start you with a tour, and we're going to start in this little corner where we've moved most of the library to. Uh, we're upstairs at the moment. Uh, until very recently, this all had crash parts from crashed aircraft all over the area. Um, this is getting revamped at the moment. So this area is, for the most part, a work in progress. Um, and we'll wander down here. We're getting up to the real junky area that uh, we've got to work on. One of the reasons I want to come up here is I need to test if the cabinet lights are working. They're not, and we've had some stuff fall in here too, so I'll have to check that out in a minute, find out where that's come from. Um, this is sort of the layout that we used to have up here, um, a crash parts and whatnot, um, accompanied by descriptions. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll go over this in a minute. One of the other reasons we're up here is we can peek down on the different sections. We'll wander down here in a minute. Now, we had to flip the American flag around um, because there are different laws in Australia as to how flags are hung when they're vertical. So we flipped that one on Jess's request. But um, this is the raft section. We'll wander down there in person in a minute. Uh, the other reason I'm up here is a little AV system that I designed. Oh, it's still messy as hell, but I need to test that that still functions. It's been off for a couple of months um, and we've obviously had lightning strikes. Over here is our World War II area and uh, earlier. We'll go down there on foot in a minute as well. And uh, we've got lots of obviously models hanging from the roof as well. So we'll go downstairs and we'll have a look at that. All right, we're downstairs and we're just having a look at the front foyer here uh, with all the bits and pieces. Somewhere hidden behind there is a remote that I need in a minute. Um, now, these are the Grumman trackers that we used to have out here. Um, and this is Neville Gibbons. He was my War II in the reserves. Um, we have, of course, his obituary here. Um, and probably some from various other people. Um, we lost Albie just recently. And we lost Bob not so long ago. Bob was a character. He had uh, stern opinions about everything until the lady was in the room. Um, now, let's go and find this remote. I think it's down here. 
this should turn on some cabinet lights. We should be able to hold this in the air and push this on and power supplies should all fire up. That one's just turned on down there. Let's see if the other end of the museum lit up. It did. And so, if, oh, okay, some of it did, but not the central section. I think let's try again. There we go. Um, and at some point, we should hear the sound system light up. We'll have a uh, light and sound show. Now, we're in the army section here. Now, this used to be my little cohort. This is where my Woe 2 used to sit. Um, and it's been taken over now by the, um, what was it? I forget the name of this, the NSCA, the National Safety Council of Australia. This was a, uh, uh, an area that was based in this after the, the military occupation of the, this base. Uh, or military ownership. Now, I've just heard the audio-visual system light up. We'll go and check that. Part of the audio-visual system is connected to this guy too. This is a mic radio from PB radio that I modified to uh, be part of the sound system. Now this thing here, we will turn up into its usual level and that at some point should fire up and start playing a sound display. In the meantime, we can enjoy the Bofors gun here. And uh, this one, we've got the block moving so we can actually cock it and simulate a firing. I've still got the pintle ring so I could hook it up to the Land Rover if I needed to. Um, now I have family connections to the Light Horse and I've also served in the 4th 19th Light Horse, which is what the 13th Light Horse got amalgamated into when there was a big reshuffle. Um, my great uncle was in the 13th Light Horse um, and a very prominent person now. Somewhere along here his photo is, but we can have a wander around in a minute. We'll spend a little bit of time just having a quick look around before we make mention of his name. Now, down here we also have a Daimler Ferret armored scout car, and uh, this does still run. And we can spin the turret round and have a look inside if you wish. So uh, there's probably a better angle to be had. We pulled most of the radio gear out of this because it was getting in the way. We needed to access some of the wiring that had fallen apart. So I still, still do need to get in here. This is a pre-selector with an upside down steering wheel. This is where you select the gear and push your foot pedal to make that gear change happen. Um, there's a bunch of other equipment here. Uh, these are all various radios. This is one I removed from a RAF vehicle several years ago. Um, that one's going to get traded for some advice on how to get this guy running. Um, and you might appreciate this flag here. This is a flag um, from the USS Missouri um, we have here. This is one that's flown on there. Now, um, I haven't taken the time to count the stars on this, but I'm pretty sure there's a couple short there. Um, so yes, we have some American stuff in here too. Uh, let's have a wander back around through Light Horse. Now we have um, deactivated munitions here as well of various sizes and calibers. Um, and we have swords and melee weapons. We have a clip here with um, ammunition for the Bofors gun. Um, you would have taken them, it can fire them as fast as you can load them in. And uh, an assortment of helmets and dummy ammunition. Uh, we've also got training ammunition down here too, the basket weave ones. Um, so along here is um, some of the sections that uh, detail the charge of Beshiva, the last great cavalry charge of the light horse. Um, and uh, in here there's a reference to uh, my great uncle as well, actually. I can't remember exactly which one of these in. He was actually wounded during that process. Um, and actually the, they all nearly died of um, thirst on that as well. Um, I took a great risk, but won as a result. Um, so there's all this section along here. And of course we have light horse attire. And there's quite a bit to see in here. Um, we're going to go back through the light horse section again as well and see our horse and our uniform in situ. And uh, there was actually something that happened here a few years ago, back when Gibbo was still here, uh, Warrant Officer Gibbons. Um, 
one of the other guys snuck in some horse poo and left it sitting on the ground behind the horse and uh, Kibo got really upset about it. That was a good joke apparently. They used to call him Grumpy. Now I'm pretty sure my great uncle, he was a sergeant at the time when this photo was taken, or it might not be this one, there's another photo very similar to this and he's up the front. Um, so yeah, we've got all of this. Let's keep moving. Uh, we have a Vietnam section over here. We can have a look. Um, we've got, obviously, samples from Vietnam, but there's more to be had as well. Uh, we've got some in storage. A 77 set, I was still using them when, uh, whoop, I can hear the M113 coming past in the sound system. Uh, we were still using them when I was in the reserves. Um, we have a few sections here. This area needs a little bit of TLC as well. Um, I'm trying to get a Vietnam vet that I know to come and assist with that. But uh, naturally most Vietnam vets are not too keen to be involved in that sort of stuff. They sort of want to move on. Um, now we have a section here dedicated to uh, women at war. We also have a Japanese flag up here that's been signed, I believe, by Japanese POWs. Uh, no, Japanese battle flag captured at uh, uh, Moritari in 1945. Uh, this section is uh, nurses and women at war. Um, and this trunk here, I think, believe, belonged to Nurse uh, Agnes uh, Nadenbush. I can never pronounce that properly. I'll need to learn that if I'm going to be running tours through the place. Let's have a wander into the even more section. There's more through here. Let's have a poke through. So, we have the nose turret that's been probably over the, about the eight years I've been volunteering here. Um, it's taken to put this back together. Uh, but this is the nose turret of a B-24 Liberator, of which we have the model here. Now notice the lights are not working in here either. Let's see if we can turn them all on. Uh, okay, I might need to fix that later. Um, yes, we have various other bits and pieces along here. This is the restoration area where we're doing some Liberator restoration stuff. Uh, although I think, yes, it's the B24, or the Oxford, sorry, we're restoring in here. Um, we have a heads up display out of a Corsair down here. Um, and we've got a few other things as well over here. So um, in this area, um, this is the restoration project that we're working on, that's the Oxford. Um, and we also have a, uh, a link trainer here. So this was for simulating night flying, uh, but everything was done on analog computing. So this whole desk here is the analog computer. And uh, we had these little units here that would actually um, indicate where the, um, the map position was um, versus where they thought they were. And you've got your pre-positioning dials that can be locked into a position here. And that is valve tech, if we sneak past a look in the back here. It's all done with valves and mechanical switches and rotary sliding contacts and pneumatic. So yeah, all interesting stuff. I think I hear the light and sound show going, so we'll wander back in this way. Now there's a bit of rumbling and thumping and as things happen the lights will flicker according to the bombs going off in the sound system. It's all been left a little quiet at the moment. But you can probably hear it if we turn it up. I'll let it go. It's just quiet background battle sounds. But um, when I run a real simulation like a nuclear fallout one some people get a bit distressed, so I do that manually. But uh, we simulate bombs falling in bunkers and that vintage radio over there plays um, actual genuine uh, nuclear fallout warning over the radio. So it does create quite an environment, especially at night. So we'll wander back over to the aircraft sections. Now, um, you may or may not be familiar with the, um, uh, the name Kovco, uh, but this guy, um, he went off to uh, Afghanistan and ended up um, dying from what is believed to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound in the barracks. Um, there was a lot of speculation and whatnot all about that. Um, in either case, his son now volunteers at the museum as well, so he set up this section with all of his uh, memorabilia and, 
uh, bits and pieces, including um, uh, the death cards and everything like that from Iraq. So uh, we're going to have a wander around the raft sections. Uh, before I get distracted one more time, this is another little gadget that I made up. And this is a, a little uh, vintage machine that's, or not vintage, but it's designed to look that way. Designed to play documentaries and shows and whatnot relevant to the museum. Almost a century since the outbreak of the first So world that all works. I'm glad that happens. That so uh, I wanted to make sure that worked. Anyway, let's go to the raft section. On the way to the raft section is uh, this display. This was all donated by its original owner, um, and I believe he's no longer with us. He had uh, terminal cancer, I believe, and he was uh, pretty much on his deathbed. He asked us to uh, put this display together, so we happily obliged. And uh, I've even got even got ration packs and everything up here. So yeah, and uh, all these. Uh, patches and rank placards as well so um, GZ had brand new uh, webbing mine's a lot older than that anyway let's go to RAF down this hallway in order to get to the RAF I've got to go past the Navy section with the Navy ranks I always laugh down here when I come past Chief Petty Officer and Able Seaman I just can't help but laugh at that um, we've got the lights turned off here at the moment uh, but their Navy section is relatively small. Um, there is the late and great Ken Anderson that I did a tribute to. Um, you can't really see it at the moment, but uh, he's on the wall here as well. That article is not strictly accurate, that news article. I have a very much more accurate account that I got from him before he passed. Uh, and I have uh, some of his memorabilia. That's going to go on this section here. So, uh, And we have a naval searchlight hiding down there. Now there is a section along here of all the aircraft crashes that is hard to see in low light. Let me just switch to lights on. Now this isn't much better because we've got most of the lights off, but everywhere there's one of these orange tags, there was an air crash in the area. Now we live around about here. So lots of air crashes around us. Um, and I think actually on base, I think there was 191 air crashes just at this airfield alone and that was down to an elevator trim tab control bolt that would bust on the aircraft that they were flying and you would basically lose all control and it would smack into the ground now hosted on our local airbase is the RAF roulettes um, and they've flown various different aircraft uh, over the ages um, most recently it was the PC-9s they've recently switched to PC-21s but they used to fly the Mackies, which we have um, a couple of out the front. So there's a lot of that here. And then we have also the an engine out of a Viper here as well, uh, which was also used in the Mackies. So we've got a cutaway there. Now we've got, obviously, my little audio visual system's working. It's playing video from the time. I'm, I'm happy to see that working. Hasn't been claimed by the Lightning. Now, they used to fly um, the Havilland Vampires, which were some of the first um, jet aircraft to be out here, and they were called the Telstars. Um, and I think before that, they were called the Red Sails. So, yes, we've had um, numerous air crashes on the local base. This is a de Havilland Vampire flying here. I'm not really an aircraft person, but I'm learning. This is a vampire that's done a crash landing and farmland near the raft base. I think that's just out the back of where we live, actually. Um, I'll have a bit more of a wander around here. We have a radio operator's training booth here as well. Um, we've got an air console here, which most of those dials are still radium coated and you put a Geiger counter up and it goes off its tits. So that's up high out of head height. Um, we have various aircraft instruments here. I think we've got a bomb site around the back. Um, and we have other photos from the local RAF base, which probably don't mean a lot if you're not from the area, but uh, I'll try and put that in context a bit later. Now, one of the, um, one of the aircraft that uh, the roulettes use actually had a crash landing uh, near the base, and uh, he had to eject. So uh, this is the seat, the ejection seat that came out of that aircraft. A bit wrinkled after it hit the deck, but it hit the deck while he was on a parachute 
I actually met the bloke when he came in to get his photo taken in here. Uh, this is the bloke that was in that ejection seat when it hit. So yes, um, anyway, let's jump next door to the next RAF section. All right, so the first thing we met here is our Pratt & Whitney ro rotary aircraft, or rather radial, not rotary, big difference. Um, so I note the TV is not working on this side. I'll have to fix that. This is for a lot of our older stuff, and we've got, again, some American examples of aircraft here um, and some German models um, and crashes that happened during World War II in the area. And I actually recognise that drain there. I know exactly where that crashed. But there's lots of these around here, and that's where my little eight-wheel drive amphibious vehicle should hopefully take me as to some of those sites. Um, and so, yes, we've got quite a bit here. So there's, um, yeah, so we've got quite a bit of uh, history here. This is getting to the area where I know a little bit less about, and this is stuff that I'm actively trying to learn at the moment. Ah, and Rick put the POW flag up. I was hoping he'd do that. Uh, Rick being the president here. Um, this, I think, actually came off an aircraft that had crashed in a local dam. Actually, no, this one isn't. This has got melted aluminium around it. This one crashed and burned on the ground. We have one near the foyer that was recovered from a local dam that crashed there. Um, so yeah, we've got lots and bits of pieces. There's a, a local air gunnery range where I dig up vintage brass from, from World War II era. And this is an example of what used to happen there. They had uh, mock targets on, uh, on a track and they'd set the, tar the turrets up in little trolleys and they'd all fire at that and um, try and learn to use the turrets properly at range. So uh, I actually know where that is too and there's some, still some remnants out there. I'll head out there at some point. But yeah, there's, there's quite a bit in this museum packed into the space we have and uh, it would take a couple of days to get through everything but hopefully this is a good little brief uh, display of actually what's out here. So we'll go and have a look hopefully over at the um, Sea Survival Centre and give you a look in the window there. Right, so we're outside now and we're looking at a Mackie. This is A7015 and uh, this is one of the previous roulette aircraft. We have A7014 over there. Around the corner we've got a couple of sets of wings off them as well. Um, now if you're familiar with geocaching, which I understand is extremely popular in the States, um, I have a little geocache hidden in the back of this one. Um, and we've got a Provost over here. Looks like the engine test vehicle's going back. They're just pushing it back again. This is our Provost. Let's wander over to the Sea Survival Training Center over here. If you've ever seen the movie The Pacific, um, this is the engine that was pieced together out of loose bits and pieces by Rudy's Aero Engines across the road. And that was uh, starred in one of the aircraft. I think it got set on fire in the movie as well. But uh, yes, we'll uh, continue our way past here for a bit and um, go over to the survival center. Right, I'm going to have to get in the shade a bit here to see this. Um, this is the Sea Survival Training Center. Now, this thing that you're looking at here and all the associated decks and platforms up here, um, which go up quite a way if I can get the camera angle right. Um, this is where you uh, learn to do your emergency uh, exit safety training from oil platforms and gas plants and stuff. And I, I worked for SO for a few years. Now, this over here is a, this blue thing you see hanging here, that is a simulated helicopter cockpit. What's covered underneath down here is a pool that's nine foot deep. Now, um, they strap you into that in full gear, they drop you in and they flip it upside down to simulate what a helicopter does when it hits the deck uh, in the water. And uh, you have to operate the safety equipment and the door and get out in time. Um, it's as scary as hell the first time you do it and then fun every other time. Uh, I think I went in nine times after freaking out the first time. So um, now we move along here. That pool is chilled to about the temperature of the Bass Strait, which I tell you now is not warm. Um, here the pool is slightly heated when it's operational. And this is where they teach you to use like Davit launch life rafts and your life vests, the big blocky things. 
um, and also you're taught how to jump off this massive higher platform here into the nine foot pool with a life jacket on in such a way that doesn't destroy your neck uh, because if you don't hold them down they fly up and bust your neck and also how to get on and off the um, the rope ladders that they use on sea deck let's continue around to the bruckers on this end we have the brucker which is a big orange thing these are life rafts I'll explain them in a minute and these white things you can probably can't see very well here they are davit launch life rafts so you basically pull a cord they swing out on that crane up there and they inflate on the crane and then you lower them down with a cable I think there's an inflated one up here somewhere and we'll go for a wander to have a look at that so this is a davit launch life raft and there's a whole host of survival equipment that's actually built into those as well um, but there's no real need to go over that at the moment we're going to wander around to the corner so we can see the brucker more closely the brucker um, which we can't really see very well from the reflection on the window uh, but these are life rafts that are self-powered boats basically and they drop them off the side of um, a platform so they're in a like a 45 degree angle frame they fit about 12 people in these off memory when you pull the cord they drop nose first into the water and they drop about 20 or 30 feet I think um, and they go fully underwater and then come back up um, that's usually designed if you're launching on the downwind side of an oil platform uh, which might be oil fire on the water at the time so yeah and you see these on some cruise ships as well so uh, yeah scary stuff when you're on them but yeah and these are all the platforms and stuff you're operating on to launch all this stuff and a bit of a look at the crane from the backside as well there but anyway we'll wander back towards the museum area this is the TAFE over this side all these buildings were part of the original RAF base that was here and of course we can see the runway out through here so and here's our car park which used to be tennis courts um, this used to be the sports center for the NSCA um, hence the courts here and then later on they used to do uh, prison um, physical education and stuff here as well for the low-risk prisoners there is a nearby prison um, actually pretty much across the road from this more or less which is across the road here is about two and a half kilometers but um, yeah that's run by Texas too or a Texas company but anyway let's wander back towards the museum and see what else there is